Hello, welcome to the 22nd Annual Barbara Jordan National Forum. My name is Hannah Munin and I am a Master's of Public Affairs student at the LBJ School. This is my second year to serve as the Barbara Jordan National Forum Co-Chair. I would like to acknowledge my student co-chair leaders, Joelle Carter and Sara gonzalez Clater, sitting up here. And on behalf of the committee, we would like to thank student leaders that have organized events throughout the forum, as well as faculty and staff that have been of great assistance in coordinating this year's forum. We would also like to give a special thanks to District Attorney John Grouseau for delivering the forum's keynote address today. This month would have marked Barbara Jordan's 83rd birthday. The LBJ School is privileged to have had her as a professor for 17 years, and we are proud to host the annual forum in her honor. The forum began in 1996 and was created by students as a way to honor Barbara Jordan's legacy as a leader, policymaker, and educator. The committee chose this year's theme, Extending the Power of the People, from Barbara Jordan's words. We believe that the people are the source of all governmental power, that the authority of the people is to be extended, not restricted. In our current political and cultural climate, people are rising up and taking back their power in a way that many students have not seen in our lifetime. In an era of mass incarceration, increasing economic stratification, and political dysfunction, overcoming systemic barriers can seem nearly impossible. Yet from the massive turnout of the 2018 midterm election, leading to an increase of representation of women as well as people of color in public office, we are seeing the very extension of authority that Barbara Jordan spoke of. Last week, we sparked dialogue on how to help women run for office, how to extend the voice of communities of color through journalism and print media, how to make the public sector a more inclusive environment, and how to spark civic activism. We are proud of the conversations that have taken place around a diverse set of issues. I can't help but to imagine that Barbara Jordan would be proud of how the LBJ community chose to honor her legacy this year. We hope this forum has inspired you to carry out the great legacy of Barbara Jordan in the quest for social justice, equity, and civil rights for all. Now, I would like to introduce you all to our next speaker, Angela Evans, Dean of the LBJ School of Public Affairs. I want to thank, uh, I want Hannah and Joel and Sarah to stand up again. Uh, please stand up and thank them so much for all their hard work. So I think many of you really don't realize how hard this work is. You know, it's an entire week uh, and it goes by very quickly, but um, all of the time that was spent in preparation uh, for these events, getting the speakers, uh, making sure everybody was here on time, being nervous about whether this was all going to go well, and now you can just relax because it was a spectacular 22nd anniversary. You all did a great job. Great job. I also want to thank the student leaders and organizations who put together events. This was a collective community effort, and I want to uh, really thank the faculty, too, who were very supportive of the many activities uh, and, um, that our students undertook. And really, um, I want to talk to you about Barbara Jordan. Uh, when I came to the LBJ school, um, I was in an office. I, they told me to go to this one office, and in the office there was a box. There was nothing else in this office. There was just this box. I had no desk, uh, nothing. And because this was through the renovation, they were re, uh, restoring. And I said, I wonder what this box is. And it was uh, Barbara Jordan memorabilia. And I was like, why is this in my office? And it had her um, speech from the Democratic National Committee, and it had a star that she was given. It was a crystal star uh, given for speaking, and it was uh, broken. And uh, went immediately um, at that time to the dean, and I don't know how it got there, and they don't know how it got there, but for me, I still get the chills. I think it was a sign that says, you know, you are here to do something with these students, and you better do it, and do it well, you know? And I just felt, I've always felt her presence here. She's a remarkable, remarkable woman. Um, and her values, her values of integrity, her values and her core to be ethical, to stand up for what you believe in, to be courageous, to be really a hard worker, never give up, never listen to everybody else's heart, listen to your own heart. That's what she was so amazing at, and that's what she's given the school, and that's the legacy we live with, that's also part of our DNA. So she's with us uh, in so many ways. 
And so our, as a public policy school, many of the principles that Barbara Jordan lived with and, and exemplified are the kinds of principles we want our students to leave our school with. And having this kind of event where you're all here and listening and, and cheering with each other helps us bring those experiential um, advantages to you as, as you move through your curriculum here. One of the um, most important things that Barbara Jordan advocated for very passionately uh, is the idea of equality. Having a level playing field and a sense of justice for all people, regardless of background or circumstance. Our keynote speaker today has embodied that idea. I got a chance, I told him I spent the weekend with him, basically. I was looking at his films and I was reading, uh, not with him physically, but uh, you know, reading a lot about him. And it's an extraordinary history um, of persistence, of ingenuity, of creativity, and you're going to hear more about him when Michelle uh, speaks about him, but we are very, very fortunate to have him here. And he really exemplifies some of the things that Barbara Jordan has in her life and how she hoped we would live at the school. Um, he is, uh, he's done some remarkably creative things, and most of them you would think, like, why would a DA do that or why would a judge do that? Uh, so you'll, you'll learn about that. Uh, when he took office in January of this year, so he's a newbie in his new office, um, he announced that he planned for his office to prosecute only violent criminals and seek alternatives for less, lesser offenses. So it's really paying attention to who comes to the judicial system and how the judicial system treats them, and that's one size fits all. And he said, and I quote, what I'm asking you to do by taking your oath here today is to join with me in another era of criminal justice reform. And he told this to 272 prosecutors who were sworn in with him. This is the kind of spirit understanding the facts of a problem, looking in different ways to solve the problems, how the laws can be applied, but also how they are implemented and daring to take a new approach. That This is the same kind of spirit Barbara Jordan had. And of course, Barbara Jordan was a lawyer as well. It's the spirit that the LBJ School is imbued with. It's the spirit that is fundamental to the work we do, that's fundamental to the work that all of you as students will be doing when you leave us. And it's also the kind of spirit that drives the work of Michelle Deitch. So I've been thinking, now how, can you, how do you introduce Michelle Deitch? Um, she is a treasure uh, to the LBJ School. Um, I've known uh, Michelle Deitch since I got here. We were neighbors in our little offices were together. Um, she is an extraordinarily dedicated teacher. She is a brilliant legal mind because she's able to take the law and interpret it in ways that make sense to common normal people. Uh, she is extraordinarily loyal to the students. Uh, one time I remember they asked Michelle and I and two other people to talk to PhD students about our courses and, and how you teach, and she was there with these detailed notes of how, like, I'm going to go to the class, I'm going to say this. If the students say this, I'm going to say this. If the students say that. So it's this very logical kind of instructional approach. But you could see what she was, in her head, she was anticipating what the students might say. And she was going to be ready for what, whatever they did. It's just extraordinary. And the work that her students have done with the state legislature, uh, with the, um, the, the court systems here is she's exposed her students to some of the most important cutting edge work that's taking place in Texas in the criminal justice system. And in November, she's added another big honor to the many honors that she's had. Uh, she became a member of the United States Supreme Court Bar and creating yet another opportunity to influence policy at the highest levels, not, not that she hasn't already, um, but she's working on so many things from you know, the uh, building of women's jails uh, to helping our students intern on you know, the state legislature. I, I can't ask for a better colleague um, to help me stay focused as a dean and also that I know I am so assured that she's giving students such a wonderful experience. Michelle? Angela, thank you so, so much for that very, very warm introduction. I'm going to step down. This seems a little too high for me. Okay. Um, and thank you, too, for not only um, uh, speaking so warmly about the Barbara Jordan Foundation, I'm sorry, about the Barbara Jordan National Forum, but also for all you've done to make diversity and inclusion such a high priority here at the LBJ School. That's um, those, in, in doing that, you've really honored Barbara Jordan because those were the values that were so important to her. Um, 
It is with tremendous pleasure that I introduce to you today um, John Crusoe. I have the honor of introducing someone who's been a close friend and colleague for almost 30 years. Before I do that, though, I want to give a little bit of history and context here. In 1977, Barbara Jordan gave a speech in which she linked law and order rhetoric to the targeting of racial minorities and the poor. And she said that a safer and more just society would come from making our communities stronger. And more than 50 years ago, President Lyndon B. Johnson reformed our system of cash bail at the federal level, calling it archaic and unjust. These wise words and policy reforms could have been ripped from the headlines today. We're in the midst of a sea change in how we view the criminal justice system in this country. Sentencing reforms that were once believed impossible are starting to take hold even in the reddest of states with bipartisan support. Legislatures are investing in community-based programs and services. Grassroots groups such as Black Lives Matter are demanding an end to racially biased criminal justice practices and to policies that criminalize poverty. And our elected officials, even prosecutors, long considered the symbol of our nation's tough on crime approach, are starting to run on platforms that demonstrate their commitment to criminal justice reform. <clears throat> Thus, I think it is particularly fitting that the student leaders of the Barbara Jordan National Forum decided to invite newly elected district attorney John Crusoe to be this year's keynote speaker. And I want to congratulate the student leaders for doing just a really fine job on this forum this year. The country was introduced to John during the most recent election cycle when he received national attention as part of a new cohort of progressive prosecutors who recognize the incredible power that they have to reduce mass incarceration in this country. But he's no newcomer to these ideas. In fact, John's 30 plus years in the law have helped to propel many of those criminal justice reforms at a national level. Like the namesake of this forum and the namesake of our school, John Crusoe is someone whose entire career has been a testament to public service, to transformative leadership, and to policy reform. He's a lawyer who has practiced as both a prosecutor and a defense attorney, and he spent more than 21 years on the uh, bench as a felony district judge in Dallas. From his earliest days as a judge, he has helped push the envelope on criminal justice policy and practice both in Texas and around the country. In fact, I first met him back in 1991 when he was appointed to serve as commissioner, as a commissioner on the Texas uh, Sentencing Commission. And I, that's where I served as the policy director at the time. John's uh, steady and persuasive emphasis on community-based alternatives to incarceration, both at that time and in the years since, have helped shift the legislature's focus away from prison and towards more effective, evidence-based approaches. He was also an innovator when it came to the development of specialty drug courts that helped turn around the lives of citizens who face addiction issues. The court that he created in Dallas, the drug court that he created there, became a model for counties around the country um, that wanted to uh, create diversion courts. John became the national guru for the drug court movement. Building on the success of that initiative, he also developed a reentry court to help people who were formerly incarcerated adjust to life on the outside. And just in case it were not enough to affect criminal justice policy in Texas and the US, John even had a hand in helping to develop a probation system in, of all places, Bulgaria. Um, in fact, the two of us actually went there together, courtesy of the US Department of Justice, where we met with the Minister of Justice and the director of the country's programs, uh, sorry, the director of the country's prisons. We schooled them in alternatives to incarceration, and we learned a few Bulgarian drinking games in the process. <laughs> um, in his new position as the Dallas County DA, 
John Crusoe is poised to continue his innovative work and his commitment to an improved and ethical justice system. And he has now a platform from which he can continue to influence the direction of criminal justice policy around the nation. John, we are grateful for your vision, your leadership, and your career in public service. And I am especially grateful and treasure our long friendship. Please join me in welcoming John Crusoe to help us honor our beloved former colleague and American hero, Barbara Jordan. Um, as you've been told, I'm John Crusoe. I'm the newly elected criminal district attorney of Dallas County. I have a speech, but I don't know if I'm going to give this speech. And um, it's about Barbara Jordan. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge Kimberly Key Gillis. Stand up, Kim. Kim and I used to work together in the DA's office. How about that? And I was not expecting to see her here today. She got smarter than I and retired <laughs> and is living nearby. And that's her daughter, who is also the proud mother of her granddaughter, who I haven't seen in years. So it's good to see you. So. That's right. Yeah, we were all doing that stuff. So, um, so I'll tell you my experiences, actual experiences with Barbara Jordan. My family runs a restaurant in Houston, and it's a fast food restaurant, and she was a state senator. And one night, she actually came there and bought some food, and I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. <laughs> the Barbara Jordan, the Barbara Jordan was there, and I had a chance to just share some words with her. Of course, I was nobody but a little pipsqueak, and so she didn't want to talk to me too much. But uh, the second time that I met Barbara Jordan was when I um, got the appointment. I was in the process of being appointed by Governor Ann Richards to the position that I held for 21 years. And the, one of the last people, other than the governor, that you had to interview with was Barbara Jordan because you, she was kind of like the ethics czar for the administration. And so I got a phone call from Carl Ritchie, who was deputy chief of staff and became chief of staff. And he says, hey, you need to get down here on a Saturday, whatever Saturday, probably next Saturday. And uh, you need to do an interview, one more interview. And I'm thinking, the session's going on on a Saturday. Nobody's there. Who am I interviewing with on, you know, on a Saturday? And so he says, well, you're interviewing with Barbara Jordan. And it's like, oh, my God. And it's <laughs> like, why am I, well, what's up with that? So he says, well, obviously, it, it's important. And so um, he tells me, you know, what, what's going on. So um, what I remember is that I showed up. It was somewhere, and it was a small table. She sat on one side, I sat on the other. I cannot even tell you what questions she asked me. I was in such awe of Barbara Jordan that I was sitting in front of Barbara Jordan. And then, at the end, she says, you know, in that deep voice of hers, well, are there any questions that you'd like to ask me? And I was like, no. <laughs> I think I'm done. <laughs> And leave well enough alone, because I'll probably mess it up, you know. So, um, and then the next person I met with was the governor, and then I was appointed, and then I spent almost 22 years doing that. But, you know, we talk about criminal justice reform. We talk about our values. We talk about the values of Barbara Jordan, the values of inclusiveness. And we don't realize what life was like for Barbara Jordan. We don't realize what life was like for my dad and for my mom, who's still alive at 91 and working, by the way. And even at my age of 61, what life was like in the South. And when you think about where Barbara Jordan wound up and who she was and what she represented and what she still represents in America, and we look at criminal justice, it's quite, a, it's quite a thing to think about, okay? We're talking about a woman who grew up when women weren't allowed in law schools, who went to law school. But she went to Texas Southern University Law School because schools were still segregated. Schools were still segregated even though the law had changed. My dad ran out of work in New Orleans and came to Texas. And he sold caps and gowns and rings and everything related to a graduation for a company. And he had a radius around Houston. And even though 
Brown v. Board of Education had long come and, and we were in the 60s, the schools were still segregated. And that's the world that I grew up in. That's the world that my dad grew up in. That's the world that my mom grew up in. And that's the world that Barbara Jordan grew up in. And Barbara Jordan finished school at Texas Southern University, now third good, uh, well, the undergrad, and went to Boston. Have any of you ever read her autobiography? I think it's an autobiography. I know I read it years ago. She said that she was really not educationally prepared for that experience <laughs> to go to that school in Boston, that she had a lot of catching up to do. And I remember that too, that when things changed, because I remember at my elementary school that when I got there, there were very good teachers, mostly Anglo teachers. We had a young, vibrant, dynamic principal. But as the neighborhood changed and it became more minority, guess what? I went back to the sixth grade and all the teachers had changed. They took all of our teachers. And we had just somebody else as the principal, and we had a bunch of teachers who didn't have the energy and the drive and the, the commitment and the care. I don't know where they got them from. They probably just pulled them from here, there, and everywhere. But all of our good teachers were gone. And that was the world that I had to inhabit. And then when I went to a better junior high, I know what she went through because I had to get caught up because that sixth grade year when those other teachers came in put me behind. And I had a lot of catching up to do in junior high. And so the world that she inhabited and that she had to deal with is quite different from the world of acceptance because she wouldn't expect in the early 1960s to come into a room and see a diverse group like this nor would she expect that somebody like me would be the district attorney of a county like Dallas. And when you think about the words criminal justice reform, those words have had entirely different outcomes and meanings because in the 80s and the 90s, criminal justice reform was lock up more people. That's what, there was reform, all right? It was called lock them up. And it was called, we're going to have guidelines. And we're not going to let the judges deviate. Why did they do that? Because there was disparity in sentencing for the same types of cases around the United States. No question about it. Okay, people were doing everything they could to get their cocaine case transferred to Miami, right? So they get probation. You go to Dallas, you get 20 years. You go to Miami, you get probation. So, you know, there was some reasoning behind that. But then we did things like crack cocaine and powder cocaine, and we didn't realize, or if we did, we didn't care that one was going to disproportionately impact one community as opposed to the other. And nobody ever asked the question, well, how does crack become crack? Well, you take powder and turn powder into crack. Who brings the powder in? The Anglo community, the ones with the planes and the strips and the this and the that. And where does it filter down to when it becomes crack? To the minority community, mostly. And so you get the, the end users and sellers serving more time than the ones who are flying it in. Okay, but we didn't question that until years later when we looked back and realized that, wait a minute, this, this system is not working. And of course now we've had some cases that can help fix that and judges have discretion but could you imagine what Barbara Jordan would do if she could come today and see with her system of values and ethics the direction that criminal justice reform is going today? So today, we have looked across America, and it is my true belief, and I'm, and I'm going to say some things that are going to implicate myself and others, it is my true belief that we have over-incarcerated America. It is my true belief that when we have a social problem, we create a criminal answer to it. And what we do and what we have assumed is that by locking someone up, 
and locking them up for extended periods of time, we're going to solve America's problems. And what we have learned is that has not solved America's problems. In fact, back in the early 1990s, when we were studying systems around the United States, we understood back then that locking people up doesn't reduce crime. Locking somebody up does not solve drug addiction. Putting someone in jail for criminal trespass does not solve the mental illness issue that they have. All you're doing is moving them from spot A to jail. They get out, they go to B, you arrest them at B, you take them to jail, they get out, they move to C, and nothing's ever changed. And yet I have to argue with police chiefs about that and major police chiefs in a major metropolitan area. You know, we have learned and we're trying to do something about this aspect of who's going to jail, who's being arrested. You know, Selena Dean and some of the students a story, a true story of an African American man in Dallas, Texas who was arrested for littering. Listen to me, arrested for littering. Now the truth is, he may have been searched and a gun found and then he was arrested for littering. That might be the truth, I don't know. But the testimony was he was arrested for littering. He was arrested for littering on the grounds of a liquor store and he was arrested and searched and a gun was found. And because he was on the grounds of a liquor store, that turned into a felony offense. You follow me? All right, you think about this. Now, do you really think in Highland Park, Texas, that if anybody throws something down on the ground, they're gonna be arrested for littering? No. So when we had this hearing, I asked the police officer, do you drive through downtown to go back to your beat? Yes, okay. So let's take a white man in a suit with a briefcase, eating a hot dog, gets through with it, crumples it up, the package, the wrapper, throws it down on the ground. You're driving down the street, you see that, what are you gonna do? He says, that's not my beat. I said, that doesn't matter. <laughs> you're on duty, it's an offense committed in your presence, and you're telling me, based on what I'm hearing, at this is not a ticketable offense. This is not a pass by, let it go offense. This is a take them to jail offense. That's what you're telling me. That's what you've already told me. So I wanna know what you're gonna do with that guy. And he wouldn't answer. And so I granted the motion. But I got a copy of the transcript. And I made an appointment with the police chief and I let him look at it and some of his senior staff. And he says, well, there's nothing wrong with this. Listen to this. He said, there's nothing wrong with that. I said, why not? He says, what's a zero tolerance zone? It's a high crime area, and we have zero tolerance in high crime areas. That sounds like it makes sense. Okay. So I said, do you know where Hillcrest and Northwest Highway are? Kim, you know where that is. It's a big intersection just north of Highland Park. And he says, sure. I said, so why don't we do this, have a little test. Everybody who has a tail light out, because they were arresting people for that too, okay, didn't turn on their turn signal and this, that, all this, you know, stuff, this nonsense. I said, why don't we have a, a why don't we have a, 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 an enforcement policy equal there to what you do down here? I said, why don't you arrest all them? Don't give them a ticket. Arrest them. I said, and you might find some drugs and some guns and stuff in their car, which would create a what? A high crime area. And he just looked at me. I said, you're not gonna do that, are you? He said, no. I said, do you know why? He didn't answer. I said, because you'll be fired in three weeks. Your job will not last if you do that. And so I said, do you understand what the bigger picture is? It's about political power and political impotence without you even thinking about it. 
that the power that that community, that neighborhood, that intersection carries is such that you wouldn't dare implement the policies that you implement down in that area of town. And that area of town is so impotent that you get away with it by saying it's a high crime area and a zero tolerance zone. And there's something morally wrong with this and this picture. And you are complicit when you allow this to go on and on and on. Well, he didn't have much to say, but one of his commanders caught me a few weeks later and said, hey, you remember that, that uh, meeting we had with the chief? I said, yeah. I said, well, the chief, guess what the chief did? Well, he wrote a note and said, knock it off, basically. He thought about it, and he realized that you were right. And so, but for having that dialogue and that engagement with him, those things would have gone on. And I must admit, I did stop seeing those cases, okay? But let's talk about complicity. Let's talk about cooperation. And let's talk about who's responsible for the criminal justice system being the way it is today, and the dysfunctional criminal justice system. I am, the judges are, I was when I was a judge, the defense lawyers are, the public defenders are, the probation departments are, and the defendants are. Okay, why is that? Let's break that down. Okay, we do things in the law based on precedent, right? I say we're the worst, worst, uh, worst profession to move forward. Why? Because we're always looking back to find out what to do forward, and that's not good. Okay, but. I now have a staff of, of 272 lawyers. And you'd be surprised how many things that we're doing that don't make sense, that don't create public safety, <clears throat> excuse me, that in fact in, in, in decrease public safety, that I ask them, okay, why are we doing it that way? And their answer is because we've always done it that way. Okay, can you tell me a good reason, even if we've just always done it that way, can you articulate a reason why we're doing it that way? And the answer is usually no. That's just the way we've done it. So prosecutors, district attorneys, elected district attorneys are complicit in where we are. Judges are. Why? Got to move that docket. Those people are in jail. I got to get them out of jail. So we have somebody with a state jail felony, and it's a drug case, and we skip the evaluation to find out if they need treatment. And we skip the evaluation if we find out, to find out if they need mental health problems, if they have mental health problems and need that treatment. You know why? Because we've got to move the case. We've got to get that case off the docket because the commissioners are putting pressure on us. So we skip the meaningful things, and then we plead them out to a felony offense and give them county jail time, and they sit there, and now they have a felony offense on them, a final felony conviction for the rest of their lives, who signed them up to it? Their lawyer, who's complicit in this over-incarceration and mass incarceration, okay? Where was the probation department? Not interested. Didn't push it my way, don't have anything to do with it, okay? If I do push it their way, what guarantee do I have that they're gonna come up with a quality product that does a good risk needs assessment, so I know what their risks are, and I know what their needs are, and what guarantee do I have that when I send them out as the judge, sign my name to their probation, that when they get there, they're gonna focus on the risk needs as opposed to threatening them and telling them they're going to prison and jail if they don't do this and do that and the other. We know that that's not a good practice. We know the better practice is to focus on their risk, well, focus on their needs. Why? Because that's what we need to correct. You go to the doctor, you find out you have high blood pressure, okay, you're at risk for what? Stroke, heart attack, this, that, and the other. What's the doctor's goal? Reduce your risk for being high risk to low risk. It's the same model. I want to take their risk level, if it's high, and reduce it to low risk. I want to do that by doing what? Doing a risk needs analysis. So I know where they are on the scale of risk, and I know what the needs are, and I trust, hopefully, that I can send them to the probation department where they're going to do the effective research-based things that are going to reduce their risk from high risk to low risk. What happens when that happens? I can let them off probation and let them go. 
maybe I can let them go early, okay? And maybe they can get that notice of non-disclosure if they're on deferred adjudication and they can move on with their lives. But instead, what we've done is criminalized an entire community of people, mostly people of color, by handling these cases this way and bypassing the opportunity for treatment. So if, the by, if, if we bypass the opportunity for treatment, what's the likelihood that they're going to pick up another case? Low or high? High. Then what's the response? We worked with you before. We cut you some slack. You don't learn. You're now going to have to do some state jail time. Okay? You're going to have to do a year in the state jail day for day. Okay? What about treatment? Well, you didn't want it the first time, which, by the way, is a bad practice. Okay? You didn't ask for it. You could have. Were you out on the streets? Were you using it on the streets? Yeah. Did you go get treatment on your own? No. Why? Because I'm a drug addict, and that's not what I do. Okay? And so we do what? We put a second case, and eventually we get enough where we start getting into the third degree range. And so then we start putting the two to 10. Okay? Who's complicit? The judge for allowing it to happen, the public defender for putting his or her signature on it, the defendant who wants it, and the prosecutor who's signing it up, and maybe the probation officer for bypassing any opportunity. Judges are complicit. Why are judges complicit even more so? Because judges are allowing pleas without doing assessments prior to making a decision on the case. Okay, we have tried and tried and tried. So we all have a role. So when we talk about criminal justice reform, this thing has, you know, gone from one end to the other. We are thankfully on the end where, where in 2005, the Texas legislature was told, hey, guess what? Those Ann Richards 100, and by the way, listen to me carefully, Ann Richards put into play processes in the legislature that we went from 50,000 to 150,000 beds and we were all on board, okay? And so in 2005, we were told that we need 17,000 more beds, 167. Well, the good news is that was unsustainable. We've come to our senses and we're doing things like divert court, mental health courts, veterans courts. We've put more money into treatment. We've put more money into assessment, whether it's inpatient or outpatient. We've tried to train the judges and the probation officers, and guess who else? The parole division on how to release people who are no longer a threat to the community. And we've actually reduced that population. We never went up to 167, and we didn't stay at 150. We're now at 141. We've actually closed eight prisons in the state of Texas. So criminal justice reform is taking place, the good news, in the state of Texas. But we still have more work to do. I have implemented a policy that first time marijuana cases, we're not taking them, up to four ounces. Did you know in Massachusetts you can have up to 10 ounces? Right, the police chiefs were complaining. I said, dude, we're talking about almost a pound up there, okay? <laughs> and I don't think Cape Cod slipped off into the Atlantic Ocean the last time I checked. Uh, you know, everything's just fine. Uh, THC, pure THC, is a felony in any amount in the state of Texas. We're not taking those cases first time either. Okay? Why? Number one, there's no connection between that and violent crime. Number two, it disproportionately impacts people of color. Number three, it's too expensive, and we're not getting anything out of it. Second case, yeah, okay. I'd like for you to learn to stop driving down the street, speeding, running a stop sign while you're smoking weed because they're going to pull you over and arrest you, right? I'd like for them to learn that. So what we're going to do is use some short cognitive behavioral therapy program, put them in that, and let them go. And we're going to dismiss the case, and we're going to allow them to have the case expunged so they can move on. What about cases that are in the system now? What are we doing to change that? <clears throat> we have people on conditional dismissals, and the Dallas County DA's office has always said, well, you can't get an expunction until way at the end of, of your statute of limitations. Now, we're stopping that. 
you finish the conditional dismissal, case goes away. Why? I want you to get a job. I want you to be functional. And I want you to do the things that you need to do to raise your family and to be a productive member of society. So th that's kind of the face of criminal justice. But we have more work to do, because we're just talking about misdemeanors. Okay, where the work really comes is those state jail felonies. And where the work really comes is people who are in prison, not just the county jail. And so we have bills going through the legislature today that are to address that, mostly through treatment, mostly through the establishment of free trial intervention programs. But we're looking at it, we're working on it, and we're going to continue to close these prisons because it doesn't make any sense. This idea that if something goes wrong, we have to create a crime out of it and lock some folks up is long gone. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're past that. And we are seeing in a different arena the moral clarity that Barbara Jordan saw when she gave that speech before the House Judiciary Committee, that 15-minute speech, which clarified for everybody where we were and where this country was. We need another speech like that, don't we? It'd be good to have one today. But she clarified things. And she helped us see who we were, where we had been, where we were at that moment, and where we might be in the future, as far as one of the most important things in our lives, which is the office of the presidency. And she continued to do that. And her moral clarity is talking to me when I have to make decisions on why do we do this? Why have you done that? What's the reason? And I get a bunch of I don't knows. If I get a bunch of I don't knows, we're in big trouble, right? We need to put some reasons that make sense, that aren't going to harm people, and that will reduce crime behind our actions in our district attorney's offices. And that's why they say the district attorney's offices, it, uh, office is a powerful office. I don't look at myself as a powerful person. I refuse to see that. But I do look at the policies as being powerful policies because we can change our neighborhoods and we can change our communities. And we can do it in the same spirit and we can do it with the same heart that Barbara Jordan brought to us and gave us, that God gave us by giving her to us and allowing us to have her for too short of a period of time and too long a period of illness where she wasn't able to function to her full ability. You know, I am, I am told, and it is written, that Clinton, uh, President Clinton, would have considered putting her on the United States Supreme Court. Can you imagine that? Barbara Jordan on the United States Supreme Court? That would have been something, wouldn't it? But because of her health and all the other issues, it wasn't a feasible thing to do. So um, I thank you for allowing me to be here and talk a little bit about what I'm doing, a little bit about my vision, a little bit about where we've been and where we're going and what we thought was right and now we know is wrong and what we're trying to do to straighten all this mess out that we created. So I don't know, is there time for question and answer? Was that anticipated? Anybody? My son goes to school here, that'll <laughs> start. So somebody will say, well, what's he majoring in? All right. Communications. <laughs> What's his dad want him to major in? Something other than communications. <laughs> yes. You need to come a little closer. Yes, definitely. Yes, both of them, Jean and Amber Geiger. Right, so the question is, in case you didn't hear it, is police misconduct, and that is a, a big part of criminal justice reform. Um, you know, that's a difficult topic to tackle. Um, we can talk about it very, very clearly, but the reality of it is, is that 
there are assumptions and I don't know, I, I can't think of the word I want to use. There are assumptions about police that the vast majority of people work off of, okay? And I used to use this argument as a prosecutor in cases, and I'll share it with you and you'll see the truth. If somebody's coming through your window in the middle of the night, okay, and you're scared to death, who are you gonna call? Mom or 911? 911. Okay, now you think about that. Everybody feels exactly the same way you do. The police protect the police. That is a fact. They're not good at investigating themselves. And that's why you have this issue of citizens' police review boards and how they will be composed and what powers, if any, they'll have, et cetera, because they don't do good. You know, you know who else doesn't do good at policing themselves? Doctors and plumbers, okay? Professors, oh, no, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's human nature. The only problem is they have guns and they can kill you and it's not about a grade and it's not about a prescription and it's not about this, that, or that. It's about something more serious. You might be in prison for something you didn't do. And so what we find is it's very difficult to pick a jury that can not think if something's going on at my house in the middle of the night that I'm not going to pick up that phone. And so what happens is, is police officers are, their cases and the accusations against them are handled differently by even the average person when you go to trial than it would if it had just been somebody else doing the same things. That somebody else might be found guilty of murder where the police officer might not have even been charged with murder from the grand jury because that's in between whatever happened in going to trial as a grand jury. And so the grand jury oftentimes reduces the offense. I'll give you an example. We have a case in Dallas, and this um, um, reporter is very proud of the fact that she somehow got her hands on this video that she wasn't supposed to have. But she aired a story, and the police officer shot a rifle, every bullet in it, through the windshield of a car and hit the woman in it five times, of course killed her, hit her in the chest five <clears throat> times. And, um, you know, there's probably a good case there. The average person would be indicted for murder. The average person would be indicted for murder for doing that. These police officers were indicted for like a misdemeanor, deadly conduct, or maybe aggravated assault, which would have been a felony, okay? But not murder. And so, that happens all around the country. We have seen situations where police officers are shooting people in the back and planting a gun on next to their bodies after they kill them. Thank God for cell phones and security cameras, right? We've seen cases in Dallas where a police officer said, um, I got the call, which is true, that the man was there and had a knife and was threatening people, but he shot him twice. And what he didn't know is there was a security camera right on it. And the man was doing this with no knife and wasn't threatening anybody. Yet the story was, he pulled a knife on me. And so what happens is the police then decided to change the process. And they gave a police officer, not you or me, charged with murder or aggravated assault, but a police officer now gets 72 hours before he or she has to answer. And guess what else they get to do? Look at all the body cam and a video camera and everything else. So even our police departments are treating our police officers differently. And that's the kind of thing that causes us to not trust the process about a police officer shooting and the investigation and the outcome. And I can't change that 72 hour. That's going to be their business. But we have a bill that I am supporting. And I have uh, registered my support that says they can't look at the video before they give their statement. Okay, we're gonna do what we can. Uh, police misconduct can be withholding evidence. So my office has drafted a bill and we have two sponsors that 
uh, gives them a duty and a responsibility to turn over everything they have instead of waiting for the last minute or we'll see it at all. So we're trying to address that. But it's just the system itself has a bias, I think, towards police officers because we expect police officers to protect us and subconsciously we do that. Grand juries do it, juries do it. And so what we're doing is we're trying to, in fact, we're reviewing all of our policies in reference to police officer deaths, whether it's a shooting or an in-custody death or whatever. And we're trying to bring fairness and accountability and transparency to the process to the extent that we can. Um, you know, we can't just release stuff just because we want to. Um, so we're trying to do that. But it is a problem. Um, it's not a perceived problem. It's a real problem. And, and I think myself and others uh, around this state are trying to deal with it in a responsible way. So, yep, thanks for the question. Yes. Yeah, we have one. Yes. Well, our Conviction Integrity Unit just agreed to some findings that went to the Court of Criminal Appeals, and they agreed with us, thank God, that uh, the person was innocent. And uh, we just had that. And we have one, two permanent people in it. I just hired another person to go in it. And then we have a grant to hire another lawyer. It's very difficult, I'll tell you, to find the right person because that's not a trial lawyer spot because you're not trying cases. And what you're doing is deconstructing and reconstructing cases and trying to find out what's wrong. So the other thing I've done is I've separated them from the appellate section because the appellate section's job is to do what? Make sure the conviction stays good. So I got this section over here trying to figure out what's wrong, and I got another section trying to make it all okay, and those two don't work well together, so I separated them out. And so you conviction integrity people do your job. They report directly to me. The appellate section, you do your job, and we'll, we'll deal with that. Um, but we have an opening, so if you know anybody who's got some trial experience, prosecution or defense, okay, not one trial, but you know, some trials, and can write well and has, uh, has long-term goals because these cases don't take six months. They take two, three, four years. We're looking for that person. So. Bring her back from Philly. What? Bring her back from she's. I don't think she's coming. <laughs> <coughs> and she'd only come as a head, and I have a head now. So anyway. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Bill Kelly, yes. I think I know him. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you go from there? Uh, that's a good that's the answer I get, huh? <laughs> and and so my job, part of my job as I see it is to uh, retrain, or maybe train, uh, them uh, to modern criminal justice and to bring along leaders who understand criminal justice reform, who understand recidivism and reductions in recidivism, who understand evidence-based decision-making when it comes to criminal justice. And um, I have, uh, yeah, there's a lot of that. I mean, when I ask them, why, why you know, why is this person excluded from this program? Well, because that's what they told us. Who told you that? So-and-so, so-and-so. Okay, well, why can't we let this other group in? I don't know. Have you ever thought about it? No, I just do what they told me to do. And I get a lot of that and um, a lot of other answers. But, you know, I have to work with the top staff right now, and I'm trying to do that, I'm trying to get them on board. Like, we're going to make a mission statement. And they, their response was, no, it's your you're the elected guy, you make the mission statement. And I said, a, a mission statement is a collaborative effort, not a one person effort. And the mission statement needs to be collaborative because you guys are doing my work. It'll have my values, but it'll have your work to create it so you understand what you're doing down the line with everybody up under you. So I tasked them with sending me something, just something. I, d I don't know, one of them sent me something, <laughs> one out of eight. So I'm working on the others. Uh, but yeah, that's a common answer. I, you know, once again, uh, we just do things because that's the way we've been doing it. Right. And we don't think about it. 
And that's what the, my goal is, is to think about it, make them think about it. And as I've told them, I'm not the future leader of Dallas County, you are. And you need to figure out what role you're going to play as a future leader. Either you're going to just, you know, slide along or you're going to do something and be relevant in the future. So, okay, thank you very much. Appreciate you. Thank you, District Attorney Cruzo, for your words um, about the challenges currently facing Dallas, um, the U.S. justice system, and um, the reforms that are necessary um, to create reform. Uh, we value the insight you've shared with us. Um, DA Cruzo embodies our theme by extending uh, the power of the people who elected him in demanding prosecu prosecutorial reform and serving marginalized communities. Uh, this keynote address couldn't have happened without our audience, um, special guests, and of course the support from the LBJ School's faculty and staff, um, Dean Angela Evans. Uh, we would like to recognize you. Thank you. We would also like to recognize LBJ professor Michelle Deitch, whose work continues to inform and improve criminal justice policy. Please join me in giving them special thanks.